Hello friends. I must say that this video is certainly one of a kind in that we have never released one quite like it. It's meant to have a twofold purpose. Number one is for all of you who have received it right now in your home and you are going to be studying the things that Jack and I uh, are going to be talking about as far as what's happening now and what will happen in the future, the book of Revelation. And uh, we're going to be elaborating on the rapture and what will happen after the rapture. And that leads me into the second purpose of this video. We would love it if you could leave this video behind, leave it on a table for someone who has been left behind, perhaps a loved one who's not accepted the Lord, he wants nothing to do with the Lord, and all of a sudden the things you've been talking about are happening. You're gone in the rapture, and you want that person to accept the Lord. This video will help him or her to open the heart to the Lord, and they can be converted even after we're gone. So it has two purposes, one, to teach us now, and two, to help those who are left behind to look uh, to the Lord and be converted. That's your idea of this uh, video, isn't it, Jim? It really is, Rexel. And of course, it's entitled, Left Behind, What's Next? And we, of course, are grateful that our dear friend, Dr. Tim LaHaye, along with Dr. Jenkins, did the Left Behind series. Now, it's interesting, Rexella, because Dr. LaHaye is a great theologian and we have promoted many of his books that are very deep uh, study-wise. And you know, that doesn't go as well. But when one promotes a fictional presentation, it's unbelievable what really happens. Now today will not be fictional. This is doctrinal from the Holy Word of God. Everything that will be spoken will be doctrinal, theologically right to the nth degree. All right, I said that we would be explaining what's coming after the rapture. Uh, take a look at the series here, Left Behind series. Like manna from heaven, and he mentioned Dr. Tim LaHaye and uh, Jerry Jenkins who wrote the book, and uh, they sold uh, 62 million copies and related series with it. Now, with this book series, I think you'll agree that they brought to the attention of the world the importance of the rapture. That's what the Left Behind series is all about. Christians are taken, people are left behind. Now, the Bible deals with this very, very thoroughly. And you know that Jack has memorized thousands of verses, over 15,000. I'm going to ask him to quote the two main rapture texts from the Bible, if you will, please. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, as presented to us by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, those that have died, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, with the dead in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Rexella, there are many ministers today who mock the idea of the rapture, and we're going to show how ridiculous they are in the light of this book. But first of all, they say, nowhere does this book speak about a rapture, so it will never happen. Wait a minute. This book does speak about a rapture, as you're going to see many times today, but the actual word is used in the Roman Catholic translation called the Latin Vulgate by Jerome. And when they get to 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and to the words caught up, that Bible states, rapimor, raptured. So it is in the Word of God. We're going to see, as I said, many texts before long that the rapture is a genuine biblical doctrine. 
All right, Jack, you gave us one verse. How about the second one? That's very important. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 54. Again, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, all be dead, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we, the living, shall be changed. For this corruptible, the dead in Christ, must put on incorruption, and this mortal, the living in Christ, must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying as is written, Death is swallowed up in victory, and will cry it, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You know, I'm sure that you noticed something, perhaps when he was quoting that last verse. It says that Christ is going to bring the dead with him, yet he's coming after the dead. It almost seems uh, like there's a mistake right there, Jack. How can he bring the dead with him and come after the dead? I'm not naming names today, but there is one cult that teaches that the soul sleeps in the body until the resurrection day. No, no, that's not what this book teaches. We find in the Word of God that when a person dies, the body goes into the ground and the spirit, which is the motivation of the body, the thinking, the seeing, the feeling, leaves that body for one of two places, heaven or hell. For the saved, this is wonderful, the Word of God teaches that that spirit leaves the body to be with the Lord, for as the body without the spirit is dead, James 2.26. That's why Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Therefore, to die is gain, Philippians 1.21. And that's why Revelation 14, verse 13 says, Happy are the dead which die in the Lord. They're there on the other side. So, well, they're all spirits. Can they communicate? Yes. It is a spirit world. God was and is a spirit. John 4, 24, the Holy Spirit was and is a spirit. John 16, verse 12, Christ was a spirit because he was in the form of God, Philippians 2, verse 8, but took a body when he came to earth through the womb of the precious Virgin Mary so that he could take a body with blood to shed it for the remission of our sins. Right now in heaven, Christ is the only one there with his new glorified body. Both Enoch and Elijah, Genesis 5, 24 and 2 Kings 2, 11, are there in normal bodies. And I'll show you why later. But again, in Hebrews 1, 14, it says the angels are ministering spirits. So everything over there is in spirit form. So when we as believers go to be with God, our spirits go. And so there is communication possible. Now, why then is the rapture going to occur when they come after their bodies? That's the question you've been asking me. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. All right, he brings the dead with him. Now, this is good for these cultists who say that the soul and spirit sleep in that body till resurrection day. No. Go back and read 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13, 14, and 15. He brings the dead with him. They're on the other side, the spirit form. And then the dead in Christ rise first as the spirit re-enters the body. And why does that have to happen? Because the Word of God teaches that we are going to rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth in Revelation 20, verse 4. In fact, after the come up hither, Revelation 4, verse 1, when we're caught up in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we find in chapter 5 of the book of Revelation, the saints singing a glorious song in verses 9 and 10. They sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy, Jesus, to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred tongue, people, and nation and has made us under our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. From every background, every ethnic group, every denomination, when they were really born again, they come back to reign with Christ. And that's Revelation 20, verse 4. They ruled and reigned with Christ 1,000 years. 
Now, get this. That's why they have to have bodies. In heaven, it's all spirits. And they communicate and have a wonderful time. They don't need bodies. But when they come back to rule and reign, they have to have a body because one cannot see a spirit ruling and reigning over them. These are all people in Matthew 25, verses 31 onward, who are still in their normal bodies and they cannot see spirits. They must see the individuals who are ruling and reigning over them. And that is the reason for this glorious event called the rapture. We need our bodies at that hour in history. Right, Jack. My mother and my father are with the Lord right now in the spirit form. That's what Jack was just talking about. No bodies up there. Their bodies in the grave. But when the Lord comes back in the rapture, their body will be changed and given a glorified body. And uh, then they'll be able to live forever and ever. One question he answered for me, and he doesn't know I'm going to ask this question. How will we be in heaven? My mom and dad were elderly when they went home to be with the Lord. Their baby's there. Now, you gave me something about DNA not long ago, Jack. How old will we be in heaven? They tell us that the DNA never ages above 33 years, anywhere from 28 to 33. That's whether it's a baby or an old person. When that DNA comes back into existence, no one will be past the age Christ was when he took on his glorified body at the age of 33. We're going to be like him. The psalmist said in chapter 17, verse 15, I shall be satisfied when I awaken with thy likeness. Philippians 3, 21, who shall change our vile, decrepit bodies that they may be fashioned like unto his glorified body. And then again, 1 John 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, when we see Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Rexella, these new bodies are going to be presented to us over that spirit form in 11 one hundredths of a second as we whiz through the heavenlies at breakneck speed. It's called the twinkling of an eye in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And General Electric has measured the twinkle in a human being's eye, and it amounts to about 11 one hundredths of a second. Now, that is spectacular when one realizes what's out there in space. We have the first heaven, for there are three, 2 Corinthians 12, 2. And that first heaven is composed of the atmosphere, the trophosphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, the ionosphere, and the exosphere. All of that covers the first 600 miles, but that's nothing. The second heaven begins with 601 miles, and now the astronomers have already, through their gigantic telescopes, Hubble and others, discovered that we're 90% of the way to the end of the second heaven, approaching the third where God rules. And they say that distance is already 187 trillion billions of miles. Let me give that to you again. 187 trillion billions. And all we have to hear is the voice crying out, Come up hither, Revelation 401. And we sweep through all of that space in 11 one hundredths of a second. I've often said this. It'd be great <laughs> if it happened someday when some of our Houston astronauts are on their way to Mars or some other planet and suddenly we shoot by them and they say, Houston, Houston, <laughs> flying objects, UFOs. They're going to be saying everything at that time. But what will have happened is what we're talking about right now, the rapture, the rapiamor, being caught up, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And that's where it's found in the Roman Catholic Bible, the Latin Vulgate. Now, the word rapture, some people say, oh, that's, that's wrong. The Lord never taught about a rapture where people disappeared and he took uh, his children home to heaven. It started, they say, in 1830 by a man by the name of John Darby. Uh, did the apostles talk about this? Jack, how about it? Did it start in 1830? Rexella, I get so tired of that statement because it is absolutely a lie. And 
Romans 3 verse 4 says, Let God be true and every man a liar. And I'm going to show you that it did not start in 1830. But every book one reads against the teaching of the rapture and there are four major Protestant denominations who oppose this doctrine as well as the millennium. I'd like to name who they are. But they teach covenant theology. And that theology says there's no rapture, there's no millennium, there is no more Jew. God's through with the Jew forever. And they have replacement theology saying that every time the word Israel appears, it should be changed to church. Every time the term Jerusalem appears, it should be changed to state that this is heaven. This is not so. It is a twisted teaching. And I'm going to prove it right now. But then there are those in the Preterist movement and others who say everything happened by the year 70 A.D. and there will never be any more signs for the future. I don't know how people can be that dishonest in representing the Word of God. Now, did it start in 1830? Let me tell you the truth. It started with Jesus in John 14, verse 3, when he said, If I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's exciting, Rexella, because there was a man by the name of Papia, P-A-P-I-A, who was a personal friend of the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, the first, second, third epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. And he said, John personally told him that the 12 apostles all believed in the teaching of the rapture and the millennium. If that doesn't satisfy you, let me give you more information. In AD 150, the rapture idea was preached by the shepherd of Hermas. In 270, Victorinus, the bishop of Pateau, a Catholic leader, preached it. In 350, Ephraim the Syrian, the great Greek Orthodox Christian, proclaimed it. In 400, Jerome in the Latin Vulgate. Then we had the thousand years called the Dark Ages. And the rapture teaching returned after that. So in 1304, Reverend Dulcino proclaimed the pre-trib rapture. In the 1400s, Bible translations in the native tongues led to a new propagation of the pre-trib rapture theory. In 1627, Joseph Mead. In 1687, Peter Giraud. In 1700, John Askill. In 1738, Philip Dotteridge. In 1748, John Gill. In 1763, James McKnight. In 1744, Morgan Edwards. In 1792, Thomas Scott. And then in 1830, John Darby. Don't give me any more of that baloney that it started in 1830. You just heard the truth from the Word of God in history. Jack, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning when the Lord taught the rapture to His apostles. And when we were studying this week for this video, Jack came to me and said, the Apostle Paul made it very plain. Second Thessalonians 2, 3, I wrote it down, talked about the rapture very mm -hmm. quickly here. Can you give it to us, okay. Jack? I'm quoting now from the King James Version. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 3, begins by saying, Let no man deceive you, for that day Christ's return to earth shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And then shall that wicked one, the Antichrist, be revealed, who poseth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, Rexella, I don't know why that word or term falling away appeared in the King James Version. For in a moment, I'm going to have you read all the other Bibles that came into existence before the King James Version, proving that the term should have been a departure, a rapture. And this is Dr. Kenneth Weiss, Expanded Translation of the Greek New Testament, Volume 3. And when he translates 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, he says, boy, this is good. Do not begin to allow anyone to lead you astray in any way, because that day shall not come except the aforementioned departure of the church to heaven comes first. 
And the man of lawlessness is then disclosed in his true identity, the son of perdition. He who sits himself in opposition to and exalts himself above everyone and everything that is called a God or that is an object of worship so that he seats himself in the inner sanctuary of God, proclaiming himself to be deity. Now, these other Bibles translated before the King James Version came into existence all teach what I've just read. Give me the Bibles, Rexel. All right, I will. The first seven English translations of apostasia all render the noun as either departure or departing. Now, they are as follows. The Wycliffe Bible, 1384. Tyndale Bible, 1526. Cloverdale Bible, 1535. Cranmer Bible, 1539. The Breaches Bible, 1576. Beza Bible, 1583. And of course, Geneva Bible, 1608. And now, Jack, they all use that word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, the problem was that King James was head of the Church of England, and even that group today will not believe in the teaching of the rapture, so these 40 translators may have bypassed the true word departure or rapture for this falling away, so they would not displease King James, for if they did, he might not allow them to translate the version I'm holding in my hand. But when you have all of the Bibles you just mentioned right. that were translations by great men of God, and they, to the last man, used the word departure, which is a rapture, uh, it's exciting. And this is what happened for you who are left behind. Jesus has come. And many of your loved ones, neighbors, friends, acquaintances, are already on the other side. And just ahead of us is the tribulation hour. Yes, Jake, that's one reason that we made this video twofold. For you who have purchased this video and you're studying it, um, you're learning more and more, I hope. But for you that have been left behind, I just cannot imagine what you're going through. You know, we have the Amber Alert. If one child is missing on the earth, where well, all the children are gone in the rapture because they're with the Lord. I cannot imagine the turmoil going on. You know, uh, the rapture is a signless time. It, there are no signs that have to be fulfilled before the Lord comes in the rapture. But because the signs of His revelation, two appearings of the Lord, the rapture in the clouds, the revelation to the earth with the saints to rule and reign, to stop Armageddon, stop all the war and all the rest, we'll talk about that in a moment. But those signs pointing to His revelation are happening even now. And how near the coming of the Lord must be, even to the earth, Jack, because they're all here right now. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're quite a theologian. No. And I want to pick up on what you said. <laughs> None of the signs point to the rapture, but all point to the revelation seven years later when He returns to the earth. And it's called revelation because He reveals Himself globally. Revelation 1 verse 7 says, He cometh with clouds and every eye shall see Him. Now, when I see all the ads pointing to Christmas, December 25th of any year, I know that Thanksgiving must be near because it precedes it by at least a month. And that's the way it is with the rapture and the revelation. Every sign you're about to give points to His coming to the earth. But since I know that we go home to meet Him seven years before that so that we can return with Him, Jude verse 14, for His reign on earth, then I know that the rapture must be very near. Just like Thanksgiving, we know to be near as we see Christmas approaching. Mm -hmm. well, you know what? Yeah, some of you are going to be saying, oh, we've always had wars, we've always had famine, we've all... But the Bible doesn't say when you see one of those things happen, I'm coming. It doesn't say when you see chariots, I'm coming. It says when you see all these things, and all these things, friends, have never happened until after 1948 because it had to happen after the formation of the state of Israel. Nothing meant anything until then. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go back and forth with Jack here. I'm going to give him, I think, maybe 25 signs real, real fast, and he's going to be uh, giving us a scripture telling us exactly where it is found. All right, oh, Jack? This excites me. I like this I part. know you like to yeah. do this. All right, first of all, the Bible says, before I come again, airplanes. 
Isaiah 31, 5 and Isaiah 60, verse 8. Horseless carriages or automobiles. Nahum chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The desert of Israel will blossom as a rose. Isaiah 35, 1. The alignment of 10 Western uh, Confederacy or the alignment of the European Union. Uh, Daniel chapters 2 and 7. The knowledge explosion in science. Daniel 12, verse 4. Great increases in travel. That's also Daniel 12, 4. False Christs and false prophets out there. Oh, Matthew 24, verses 5, 11, and 24. Wars and rumors of wars. Matthew 24, 6, and that's Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Something breaks my heart, famines. Well, Matthew 24, 7. Earthquakes in different places. That's um, Mark 13, verse 8. Pestilences, we'll talk about that in a moment. Luke 21, 11. Iniquity shall abound. That's spoken by Jesus in Matthew 24, 12, and again in 2 Timothy 3, 13, where evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We're trying to help fulfill this next one, friends. The gospel of the kingdom preached in all the world. Matthew 24, 14. Signs in the sun, moon, space. That's Luke 21, verses 25 and 26. And what goes on in the heavens will so startle people that their hearts will fail within them because of what's coming to pass on the earth through these heavenly planets. The introduction of evil spirits and cults and apostates. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. The hoarding of gold and silver. James chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. False prophets denying the deity of Christ. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Oh, we've been talking about this. Scoffers mocking the second coming. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 states, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since our fathers, grandparents fell asleep, all things continue as they were. Really? You're going to be shocked in a few moments. The invention of the atomic bomb. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. Lethargy and indifference among God's people. They couldn't care less. The Laodicean church of Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 to 18. Jerusalem emerging as an international bone of contention. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, where uh, Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling. Oh, and this one we see the rise of anti-Semitism among the Islamic fundamentalists. This is amazing. That's Psalm 83, verse 4. It says, Let us cast them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. Russia's new military power and its alliance with the Islamic world. That, of course, is Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39, Joel chapters 2 and 3. And you can find this alignment with the Islamic world in Daniel 11, verse 40, Ezekiel 38, verses 5 and 6, and then Psalm 83, verses 4 to 7. And the emergence of a world mighty power in Asia or, or China, Jack. Well, we're going to be talking about that later. That's Revelation 16, 12, as they come from the east down through the area of the Euphrates River for the greatest war in history is recorded in Revelation chapter 9, verses 14 to 18. Oh, Jack, thank you so much for all those scriptures. Now, something has just happened, I think quite remarkable. It has to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it talks about the rapture, and right? Those Jack? who will be left behind. Right, all right. Let's. This uh, is a late breaking report. Yes. And this is by the journalist David Augustine. Headline A newly discovered Dead Sea Scroll has revealed who will be left behind when the rapture comes, a leading scholar reports. The scholar, Dr. William Harold, professor of canon law at the Theological Seminary of Essex in Great Britain. He says, without doubt, this is the most important discovery in the history of biblical archaeology. The scroll written in Aramaic, the language spoken in the Holy Land during Jesus' time on earth, was found in a cave on the shores of the Dead Sea by geologists conducting a survey for the Israeli government. And what does that scroll say? This goes right back to the beginning. Yes, oh, yes. I got goose pimples. <laughs> the rapture will occur suddenly and countless thousands will vanish from the earth, swept up to heaven to live with Jesus and escape the torment of the tribulation. The others will be left 
behind. Oh, How do you like that? That's tremendous. The Dead Sea Scrolls. Yes, tremendous. After the rapture, there are going to be 21 judgments fulfilled. Some of them we can see, as Jack said before, on the horizon, they're beginning to form, and we know that they are going to happen very, very soon. It seems like so soon. But the fulfillment of the 21 judgments, the completion of the 21 judgments, happen after the rapture. So you who are left behind, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see 21 judgments on the earth, something that's never, ever, ever happened before. Jack, uh, can you give me a, a scripture telling me that the 21 judgments will happen after the rapture? Oh, well, we could get into this pre-trib rapture teaching, and we believe that the church will be gone because the message to the seven churches is found in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And after the come up hither of chapter 4, verse 1, it's impossible to find the church on earth for the next seven years. And they only return as the bride of Christ in chapter 19, verse 14, when he comes as the king of kings and lord of lords. Revelation 19, 16, to rule and reign for a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 4. Plus, when one studies Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, the four and 20 elders, and they represent all of God's people, the Old Testament, Patriarchs 12 and the 12 apostles representing Christendom in the New Testament, a total of 24 bow their knees to the Lord Jesus Christ and they cast their crowns at his feet in Revelation 4.11. Now, Luke 14.14 14 says, one cannot be crowned until the resurrection of the just. So that resurrection has occurred. They've heard the come up hither. They're there. The Bema Seat of Christ where the life service was judged, 2 Corinthians 5.10, has occurred. And now they have their crowns and they're laying at his feet. Oh, there are just so many arguments, Rexella. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. And Jacob is the Jew, 2 Kings 17, 34. This is not for the church. We will not be here. We will have been taken. But, you know, we're going to run into a three, four-hour video if we don't keep oh, moving here. But got I've got going. scores of ideas about this in my book, The Great Escape. And I'll tell you, it's something you should have in your possession. A few hundred pages proving the church will have been evacuated in the twinkling of an eye. All right, Jack. I'm just going to give a panoramic view now of the 21 judgments that are going to happen after the rapture. All of you who are left behind will experience this. And I'm going to give you some hope in just a moment at the end of this video. There is hope for you. That's one reason we wanted to leave this video behind. But uh, Jack brought up a name to me, Dr. Terry James, and he said, you know, Dr. James and I totally agree on the following occurrences of what's going to happen after the rapture and the fulfillment of uh, what's going to happen for those who are left behind. First of all, we're going to go back and forth here. Then we're going to show you some pictures and headlines showing you that it's starting already, friends. It's starting already even now. First of all, one world government will come together. Uh, that's Daniel chapters 2 and 7. Daniel chapter 7, verses 7, 8, 20, 24, Revelation 12, 3, Revelation 13, 1, and Revelation 17, 3, 7, 12, and 16. Not only a one world government, but a one world church will form. Oh, that's a Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And this is the false prophet that's going to appear very soon. Yes, and a world leader will come out of Europe, the European Union, and he'll take charge of the peace process. He comes out of that revived Roman Empire, the European Union, Daniel 9, 26, for he is the prince that shall come and is of the people who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And that was Vespasian and his son, Titus, Roman general. So this is the revived Roman Empire, the European Union. And again, that's Daniel 9, 26. Jack, I want to stop here just, just for a second. We stood in front of the European Union building in Brussels, mm -hmm. And I looked at that front door the last time we were there, and I thought, right in that building is the Antichrist. He's going to walk through that door. Mm -hmm. He's probably on the sixth floor right now. It's all forming so quickly, isn't right. it? Uh, 1 John 2, 18 says, Antichrist shall come, and Cardinal Biffy of the Catholic Church says that he believes 
Antichrist is alive and waiting in the wings. So that goes along with what you just said. Absolutely, and the Israeli government and Israel's enemies will sign an agreement of peace that will ensure peace and safety. Daniel 9:27. Peace will not last as a coalition of nations led by Russia invade Israel. They're going to be saying peace, peace, but there will be no peace, Jeremiah 6, verse 14, because Russia, under the names Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Rosh, Ezekiel 38, verses 1 and 2, say, I will go down against them that are at rest, that are at peace. Ezekiel 38, 11. There hasn't been an Israel for almost 2,500 years. Since they became a nation in 48, there's been no peace. But soon, the one will arise out of that European Union, and there will be a peace contract signed for seven years, Daniel 9:27. But after 42 months, Russia will make that move and break all the contracts. The nerve, the nerve of this Antichrist. Woo, it makes my blood boil. He's going to stand on a temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, and he's, you know what he's going to say? I am God, and you have to worship me. Woo. He says he's God. Daniel 11, 36, he will magnify himself above every God. And standing on that temple, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, uh, it says that he's going to be in that temple, and he is going to say, I am God. And the false prophet, the one who made this world a church come to life, will say, worship the Antichrist. I'm making an image of him. Worship him. And that's, of course, Revelation 13, 11, when this false prophet comes to power and he points all of the people toward the worship of the Antichrist. And that's when he makes this image to him in Revelation 13, verse 15. And, of course, you can find that throughout the entire Word of God. Why are computers so important, Jack? I'll tell you why. Antichrist regime will institute a computer mark and numbers system. It will be both to control the world's populations and to cause all to worship the Antichrist, whose number is, you know it, 666. Rexella, that is really the Word of God, and that is found in Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18, and that number 666 is verse 18. One can find it in Revelation 14, verses 9 and 11, chapter 15, verse 2, chapter 16, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 20, and chapter 20, verse 4. And if you refuse to take the mark of the beast, 666, they're going to start beheading those who refuse it, Jack. Revelation 20, verse 4. Antichrist will begin a systematic genocide against the Jewish race and make the Holocaust look uh, mild in comparison. That's Revelation chapter 12, verse 13, and it's described in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great. There is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob changed his name to Israel in 2 Kings 17, 34. And for all those who accept the Lord after the rapture, the Antichrist and the false prophet are going to try and round you up, torture you, and murder you. That's Revelation 6, verse 9, and chapter 13, verse 15. While the Antichrist hunts down and murders people, God's judgment will begin to fall. He's going to say, I'm God, not you, right? And there are 21 judgments found in Revelation chapters 6, 8, 9, 11, and 16. Now, how many will die during that time? Millions and millions of people will die. Oh, that's no doubt about it. When studies uh, Revelation 6, 9, as I already said, chapter 13, verse 15, chapter 20, verse 4. Now we're going to go into detail about those 21 judgments. So this is one of the things going to happen. A great object will fall into the ocean from space. Its impact will kill the life in the sea. I'm going to tell you about that in a moment. And most likely will destroy coastal areas with tidal waves. That's Revelation chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, and chapter 16, verse 2. Great unprecedented earthquakes. Oh, my. Revelation 6, 12, chapter 8, verse 5. Then chapter 11, verses 13 and 19 of the greatest earthquake in history, chapter 16, verse 18. People are going to be so frightened they'll have heart attacks all over the place just from seeing the things that are happening, Jack. That's Luke 21, 26, and Jesus said it. Men's hearts will fail them for fear, for looking after those things which shall come to pass on the earth, for the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. You know, Jack, God is going to move 
in the minds of all military forces. And uh, they are going to gather in the valley of Jezreel, not too far from the ancient city of Megiddo, right there in Israel. And you know the word. This is where the Battle of Armageddon is going to happen. Oh, the misunderstanding about Armageddon. It is not the end of the world, for it's a world without end, Isaiah 45, 17, and Ephesians 3, 21. It's a 42-month campaign, not just one battle. And we'll describe that later. But Armageddon, Revelation 16, 16, is only the gathering place. That's not where it's fought. From there, the armies march to uh, the valley of Jehoshaphat, Joel 3, verse 2. And the reason that they're going to move ahead as all nations come against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, 2, is because, go back to Joel 3, verse 2, they parted the land. And that's what Antichrist will do as he parts the land. As you saw, you folks have been left behind. And because of it, God's anger came down upon the world because the land belongs to Israel, the Jew. But Jack, this Antichrist could not bring peace. He had a seven-year peace contract, but it only lasted three and a half years. And then this horrible thing, Kings of the East, a huge army out of the Orient, numbering 200 million troops will invade to make war with this Antichrist and his armies. They're all going to meet there. Battle of Armageddon. Oh, we'll discuss that thoroughly in a few moments, but that's Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, and the battles described in Revelation chapter 9, verses 14 to 18. All right, you know who's going to win, of course. Jesus will return with the armies of heaven. His armies consist of the mighty angels and his saints, which were raptured at least seven years earlier. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's Jude verse 14. It says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied these things. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Rexella, yeah. do you realize what that says? Seven generations after the creation of Adam, the word of God was already predicting the return of Christ as these saints come back with the Lord. And it's described in Revelation 19, verse 11. Christ comes on that white horse regally, royally, and majestically. Who's with him? The armies in heaven follow him, verse 14. And that's when he comes as the King of the kings and Lord of the lords, verse 16, to rule and reign for 1,000 years, chapter 20, verse 4. And you know what's going to happen, Jack? The nerve, the arrogance of the Antichrist, he and all of his armies are going to try and prevent Christ from coming. I can't imagine the nerve of a man like that, Jack. They don't want our Lord to come and fulfill the prayer of Matthew 6, 10, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So because they are anti-God and anti-Christ, they're going to try to stop this one who comes on the white horse, who's called the Word of God, and that's his title in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 14. And he's coming there in Revelation 19, verse 11, but when we get to verse 19, it says, the beast, the Antichrist, and all the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against Christ, the one who sat on this white horse. So we don't want you, Jesus, but he's going to be victorious. All right, Jack, we know who's going to be victorious. But you remember a moment ago, I said that the Antichrist would hunt down anybody who had accepted the Lord and try to kill everybody on earth. Probably millions of people will die during that time, but God's judgment, 21 of them will begin to fall directly on the rebellious people of the earth, including, you know, those who follow the Antichrist. Well, there are 21, as I said, seven seal, seven trumpet, and seven bowls. That makes the 21 judgments. Well, number one is a seal judgment. Number one of the seal judgment is this, EU and NATO, a race for influence. Now we're going to tie this together. The EU hopes to push Mideast peace at Mediterranean talks. Now, as you well know, the EU is flexing its muscles and it is becoming a, a world power, as you well know. And pretty soon they're going to take over as the number one power in the world, aren't they, Jack? They are, Rex Ellen. You know, I wrote this book, Revelation Revealed, in 1983, predicting everything you're going to hear and you who've left behind 
had you been able to study this book verse by verse, would have known what was going to come, first the rapture, and then those who would be left behind, but it's not too late yet. As you hear the 21 judgments that are about to come, you'll still be able to find salvation during this time as we're going to prove today. But seal one is found in Revelation chapter six, verses one and two. He said, I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the voice of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse and he that sat on him had a bow and a crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This is the infamous Antichrist. Mm. He's always tried to counterfeit everything Christ has done or will do. And Christ is coming on that white horse in chapter 19, verse 11. So he says, I'm going to beat him to the punch. Now, this can be found, as I already said, in Daniel chapter 7, verses 7, 8, 20, 24, Revelation 12, 3, and Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, Revelation chapter 17, verses 3, 7, 12, and 16. Does this book describe the Antichrist? Yes. First of all, he is the king of fierce continents, Daniel 8.23. What a barbarian, filled with hatred. A man who mocks God, who says, I am God, Daniel 11.36, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Because he wants to become the God of the nations, he blasphemes the name of the true God, Revelation 13, verses 5 and 6. And this false prophet in religion who forms the world church of all denominations of those who've been left behind promotes him in Revelation 13, verses 15 to 18. And one thing this false prophet does is create a numerical system. And of course, it's discovered and described in Revelation 13, verses 16 to 18. Watch it because it's going to come to you about 42 months into the tribulation period. And it says, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or forehead that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Let him that hath understanding count the number of this Antichrist, this beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. Six, six, six. You've heard the rock groups even proclaim it in the past. And you can find this also in Revelation 14, verses 9, 11, chapter 15, verse 2, chapter 16, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 20, and chapter 20, verse 4. And if you won't take that number, you'll be put to death. Revelation 20, verse 4. Yet in Matthew 25, millions have survived the tribulation hour without taking a mark. I don't know yet why or how, but keep your eyes open because there will be a way to avoid taking that infamous number 666 during that period of time. And you know, Rexel, mm -hmm. oh, what's going on right now? We have Echelon in England. Do you know that they receive and translate three billion communications daily in almost every language on the face of the earth to keep track of human beings? And in our time, right now, Japan has a computer that does almost 13 trillion 700 billion calculations per second. But America is working on one now that will do 20 trillion calculations per second. And the latest news report is IBM is working on a monstrosity that will do 150 to 250 trillion calculations per second. He's going to be able to keep track of us. And I'll tell you, this monster is going to rule for seven years, Daniel 9, 27. Then when he tries to stop Christ, when Christ comes to set up his kingdom in Revelation 19, verse 19, we see that the Lord destroys him and casts him into the lake of fire in Revelation 19, verse 20. Oh, Jack, you know, I'm speaking to you again. The Antichrist will keep track of all of you. You'll not be able to hide but how wonderful to know. I'm going to give you hope. Don't give up yet. Seal number two concerns peace and war. Russia begins the first phase of the Armageddon campaign. Russia is to stage largest nuclear exercise in 22 years. 
Again, Russia reveals a new missile threat and new nuclear weapon to surpass others, Russia's Putin says. And here's Iran's Bushehr nuclear reactor, 90% ready, Russians speeding up work on it. And here you see one of three of the missiles already in Tehran. And they're not giving up. They are going to have quite a nuclear arsenal there, according. They're not uh, backing off at all like we thought they might. Friends, I just want to say that you are in the worst time of history that the world has ever seen. Jack, a sad, sad time of war, right? Mm -hmm. And this second seal judgment is found in Revelation chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. The rider on the white horse in verses 1 and 2 is the infamous Antichrist who gets Israel and the nations to sign a peace contract in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, for seven years' duration. However, it only lasts for 42 months because this rider on the red horse breaks the contracts and moves in against Israel. Now, who is this culprit? In Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 and Joel chapters 2 and 3, we find it is definitely Russia. Why? Under the titles of God, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, and Rosh, Ezekiel 38 verses 1 and 2, all cities identifiable in Russia today, we find the war of the latter years and the latter days discussed in that 38th chapter, verses 8 and 16, as they come from the north against Israel, verses 15 and 16. And Russia is directly north of Israel. In fact, if you go to the North Pole from Israel, you go right through Moscow. So the peace has been made. But this Russian monster says in chapter 38, verse 11, I will go up against them that are at rest, that are at peace. And as I said earlier, this is unbelievable because there was no Israel for almost 2,500 years until 1948. From then on, they've had war after war. There has not been a day of peace. But soon this one will set up the peace. And this infamous Antichrist of verses 1 and 2, who rides that white horse, makes the peace, as I've said. But it will be the covenant of death and hell, Isaiah 28, 15. Because through this peace process, he destroys millions, Daniel 8, 25. Why? Because it's a false hope. The world is crying, peace, peace. Oh, it's here. Peace, peace. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13 and chapter 8, verse 11. But there will be no peace. You have been left behind. Are noticing this even now? And then suddenly something happens as God intervenes. He rains fire upon Gog of Magog, Ezekiel 39, verse 6, and they are driven back to Siberia, Joel chapter 2, verse 20. That is the first wave of a three-point movement against Israel in the Middle East. So that puts Russia down for a while. A ragtag army will come back with China later in this video, as you'll see. But that's where Russia is for the moment. The rider on the red horse has been defeated. Friends, not only is there going to be war, horrible war like never before, but the third seal judgment is concerning famine. And as we sit here doing this video for you right now, two billion people in the world will go to bed hungry tonight and one billion will be starving. No hope. Take a look. Poverty. We'd like to see the end of poverty, but there are some children right there. My heart breaks with no home. Only place to sleep is a terminal. And a woman goes through a dumping ground. She's try trying to find something for her children to eat. A garbage dump. There are people starving in the world, and it's going to escalate. You're going to be seeing that hunger in the world, Jack. And this judgment is found in Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And when he had opened the third seal, 
I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see that you hurt not the oil and the wine. A measure of wheat for a penny. A measure with 16 ounces like a loaf of bread. A penny was a day's wages. It'll take every available family member working to buy a loaf of bread daily during that time. Rexel, you know what breaks my heart? Ted Copeland, Nightline, said, the waste of food in this country is atrocious. He said, we discard enough food in 12 months' time in the United States of America to feed the entire third world for a year. God's going to hold us accountable. Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, the fourth seal, friends, has to do with pestilences, acceleration of pestilences. Our federal government right now is taking the threat of highly contagious diseases very, very seriously. Well, the U.S. will stockpile a defense against smallpox and the fearsome flu. Each year, 36,000 Americans die from influenza and 200,000 are hospitalized just with the flu. And uh, certainly a new pandemic could kill 2 million to 7.4 million people worldwide because of some kind of flu epidemic. Jack, oh, very, very serious. Is going on, and that, of course, is that fourth judgment found in Revelation chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Jesus talked about pestilences in Matthew 24, verse 7, and Luke 21, verse 11, and they are here. 25 new diseases just in the last 25 years. We've got necrotizing fasciitis, the flesh-eating disease. We've got the avian flu that could kill up to 7 million, 2 million in England alone. We have AIDS, as we'll t discuss later, that's already killed 40 million. Why? Because this rider on the fourth horse actually sees one-fourth of the population of the earth dying. It says his name was called death, and hell followed with him. And unto him was given the power of the fourth part of men to kill with the beasts of the field. AIDS, the green monkey virus, avian flu, ducks, chickens that are diseased, and on and on it goes. I now know of the 25 new diseases, majority of them have to do with animals, the beasts of the field. The prophecy has already begun. You'll see more of it. You've been left behind. Words fail me, friends. I just can't even attempt to explain the horror of seal number five. It has to do with persecution. Well, we all know about the persecution of the Holocaust, but in comparison, even this is going to seem very minor uh, according to what the Bible predicts for this time. Again, Nigeria. Zamfara government orders demolition of all non-Muslim churches. And Egypt launches crackdown on Christian converts. Saudis arrest 40 Christians for praying. Christian convert gets Muslim death threat. Now, you know, friends, during the time that you're living right now, many are going to turn to the Lord. A lot of people are going to accept Christ as their Savior. I'm afraid to be, uh, to say that it's going to be a time also of uh, tremendous persecution. Jim. Oh, and this fifth judgment is found in the sixth chapter of the book, Revelation, verses 9 and 10. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? First of all, there'll be a horrendous persecution of the Jews found in Revelation 12, verse 13. It will be Satan's last attempt to try to annihilate God's chosen people of Deuteronomy 7, 7, whom he loves dearly, the Jew. And then here in Revelation 6, verse 9, we see that anyone who honors the word of God and has a great testimony for Jesus Christ will be put to death. 
And then in Revelation 13, verse 15, in chapter 20, verse 4, we find that they're put to death and even beheaded because they would not receive the mark of the beast, 666, Revelation 13, verse 18. And we've seen some of it in our time, but oh, it's going to get horrible during the remainder of the tribulation hour for you who are left behind. Now, someone says, hey, Christians are still being persecuted. How come? I thought they were taken up at the rapture. Come up hither, chapter 4, verse 1. Why are they dying here in chapter 6, verse 9? Because the greatest revival in history will occur during the tribulation hour. What? Yes, don't you remember Joel chapter 2, verse 30 and Acts chapter 2, verse 20, where it says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. The greatest revival in history is going to occur as the Holy Spirit comes upon people. Some say, I thought he was taken. No, those in whom he lived were taken. But he is omnipresent. He can never leave this earth. He's God. And Psalm 139 says he's in heaven, he's on earth, he's in the sea, he's even in the depths of hell. He's God and therefore everywhere at all times. So he's doing a tremendous work. And that revival is described in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 and 14. He says, I saw a multitude like the sand of the sea, which no man could number. Millions upon millions upon millions. And verse 14 says, They came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. And it is this group that is being put to death during that time. The raptured are on the other side, enjoying the comforts of heaven, soon to return to avenge those who've put the new believers and the Jewish people to death. Mm. Jack's going to show you in just a moment, if you've been left behind, how you can be a part of that great revival turning to the Lord. He's going to show you how to accept the Lord, right, Jack? Oh, I really am. There's right. hope. Amen. There is hope. Oh, my. Well, seal number six will have a great vengeance uh, during this time, something that scientists have been fearful of for a long, long time. Take a look. Close call coming. Scientists are concerned that a large asteroid or comet could strike the Earth, causing catastrophic damage. Oh, my Jack, we've been concerned about this for a long, long, long time. And that's Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Carl Sagan, the great scientist and astronomer, now deceased, said, no doubt about it, an asteroid is going to hit this earth in the future. And when it does, the sun will be blackened for 120 days. The rays will be obliterated and blotted out because of the dust that ascends into the heavens through the horrendous shaking of the earthquake. And that's interesting because Joel chapter 2, verse 31, and Acts chapter 2, verse 20, both say the sun became darkened. Now, Jesus said it would happen and pinpointed the exact time in Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, toward the end of the seven-year period, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. So keep your eyes open. You've been left behind. This is also to come. But there's still hope, as we're going to show you later. All right, the last of the seal judgments, seal number seven. I don't have any pictures for this, and I want Jack to please explain this to me. Silence in heaven for half an hour? What does that mean, oh, Jack? Oh, I love it. Remember Bob Ripley? Yes, who had I a do. column, believe it or not, uh -huh. years ago? Uh -huh. One day he asked the question, will there be women in heaven? He says, answer <laughs> tomorrow. And as they opened the newspaper, they saw Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. No, no women on the other side, because there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. No, no. Seriously, now, uh, what, what does that mean, Jack, about silence in heaven? Actually, the angels and those who are in heaven are really burdened because they know what the next 14 judgments contain. So there's great solemnity. They're hardly able to talk to one another because of the catastrophic judgments that are now to come upon the earth, far more horrendous than the first seven 
we've just discussed. All right, the seal judgments. Now, why do they call them the seal judgments? Because the seals were broken. All right, now, why do they call it the trumpet judgments? Because with every judgment, an angel sounds a trumpet. And the first of the trumpet judgments has to do with atomic warfare. Take a look. Turkey sits on Islamic time bomb. North Korea has bought complete nuclear bomb. And Jamie Peterson, who edited a book called The Aftermath of Human and Ecological Consequences of Nuclear War, said, should that war erupt now, the environmental toll would include massive water contamination, radiation fallout, toxic rain, uncontrollable fires, and the resultant inability to grow food. Now, you know, friends, this is going to happen during the tribulation time, and you are seeing that right now if you are left behind. The inability to grow food, Jack, oh my. Because of atomic warfare, yes. and that is Revelation 8, 7, where the first trumpet is blown. What does it say? The first angel sounded. Sounded what? The trumpet. And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt, and all green grass was burnt. Where does this book talk about atomic warfare? The invention of the atom in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. And then atomic warfare, when you stop to think that the USA, Russia, China, France, England, Iran will soon have it, North Korea, 30 nations, many Islamic nations with atomic weaponry ready to go. When it happens, oh God help this whole world. And You've been left behind. You'll see some of it. Where do you find it in God's Word? Psalm 97, 3, Isaiah 66, 15. Ezekiel 20, 47, Joel chapter 2, verses 3 and 30. Zephaniah 1, 18, Malachi 4, 1, the text in question, Revelation 8, 7. And chapter 9, verse 18 says, By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone, the exact effects of a nuclear blast. As we're preparing this for you, the second trumpet judgment seems to be working its way out. The contamination of the world's waterways, the oceans, preventing people access to safe water and making dead zones devoid of fish. Ocean dead zones, a rising threat United Nations agency warns. Now those dead zones have been around for quite a while, of course, in the Gulf of Mexico, Chesapeake Bay, and it's been in the Baltic Sea, and it's expanding into the Black Sea, and all over the place. So much of it is happening because of the dumping of nuclear waste and so many, many other things, Jack. Nothing can live in those oceans. So we're not going to have fish or anything like that. Everything is going to be dead oh, in the oceans. I was overwhelmed as I studied some of the reports because there are areas now, 150 of them, where they call it oxygen-starved oceans, meaning that the pollution has literally wiped out all of the oxygen in those areas and fish are dying by the millions because the oxygen's gone. And do you know that in one area, this problem covers 27,000 square miles? So it's not hard to believe what this book says. And more of it's coming, and that's in Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 and 9, the second trumpet judgment, as Rexella said. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became bloody or deadly. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And they are dying now for lack of oxygen. The prophecy is with us. Jack, the angel trumpets the sound once again. It is the third trumpet judgment. And it has to do with our environment again. This surprised me. Cracks in decaying shell of Chernobyl reactor threatened second disaster. Now, friends, why does that surprise me? Because that word Chernobyl is found in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Is that right, Jack? Right. Rick, so I'm 
holding the King James Version here, but I'm going to uh, pretend that I'm studying the Bible of the Ukrainian people, for Chernobyl is located in the Ukraine. And it says they have been startled as they read their Bibles, for this is what they read. And that judgment is described in Revelation 8, verses 10 and 11. The third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. In the Ukrainian Bible, Wormwood is actually translated as Chernobyl, the very thing that happened in their country. Let's continue. What does Chernobyl do in the future? Well, the third part of the waters became Chernobylized, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter and poisonous through Chernobyl. It has already happened. It's about to happen again. And you who have let, been left behind, watch for what's coming. Do you remember I said seal six uh, before a little bit ago, where the asteroid hit the earth, had catastrophe happen? Well, the trumpet seal of four, the trumpet judgment number four, is a repeat of that. So apparently there's going to be another terrible asteroid bombarding our Earth. Jack, a terrible time. And that's Revelation chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. It states, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Mm. That is, again, this asteroid hitting the earth, as we said, under the seal judgments. But what's coming is so bad, and this is why there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour, verse 1, is because of the future. Whoa, 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 three times. And whoa, defined, always means judgment to come. This judgment is coming on the earth, friends, to all of those who hate God to all of those who think they can replace God, the Antichrist, and those who follow him. Ah, oh, this next one. Number five, a trumpet of the, of the uh, angel sounds again, and it is swarms of locusts devouring the earth. Swarms of locusts descend on southern Israel. Once again, swarms of locusts descend on the island, and that's the Spain's Canary Islands right there. Swarms of locusts descend on Egypt. We are going to switch gears here, as you can see, but we are going to tie it together in a moment. Careful how you monkey with DNA. The laboratory creation of Chimaraz. Take a look mixing humans and animals for science. Animal-human hybrids have long been the stuff of fairy tales and myths, half man, half horse, like the singing mermaid, you know. Now, the swift pace of genetic engineering has some worry that such mixed creatures known as chimeras, after the fabulous beasts of Greek mythology, are making the leap from the pages of fiction to Reality. Wow. Oh, Jack, that's something else. They've already been tampering with mice and humans, mixing the genes, and they are now afraid that a mouse might be born with the brain of a human being and vice versa. God help us. They are going to really get into trouble with this. Now, notice that all these locusts are swarming the earth. And notice that they're going to now create animals and humans as a mixture. Maybe Revelation 9, verses 3 to 10, which is this fifth trumpet blast upon earth, pictures what's coming soon. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, 
but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. This speaks of strength and speed. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold. This speaks of royalty, a picture of conquerors. And their faces were as the faces of men, denoting intelligence. Did you notice that? The bodies of horses, but the faces of men, chimeras. And they had hair as the hair of women, picturing attractiveness. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions, portraying cruelty. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron, picturing invincibility. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle, denoting calamity. And they had tails like unto scorpions. Mm. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men for five months. Oh, that's one of the woes. I feel sorry for those who've been left behind, Rexella. Yes. The angel lifts the trumpet once again, and it is the sixth trumpet judgment. You remember in the seal judgments, I said that Russia came down from the north and invaded Israel? Well, this judgment is the second invasion of Israel. It's a part of Armageddon. This time, the kings of the east with their huge army comes, and it is the great Chinese army coming across to Israel, China, Russia to stage war games. The Chinese military buildup causes U.S. concerns. And that is as I'm sitting here right now, they are building that huge army to fulfill that sixth trumpet judgment invasion of Israel, Jack. And that is Revelation chapter 9, verses 13 to 18. The sixth angel sounded and heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Now that's important because that's where our troops are stationed right now in Iraq, around the Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of mankind. And the number of the army of the horsemen was 200,000, 200 million. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. And then that sat in them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. And out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the nuclear war described earlier in Revelation 8, verse 7. And we're going to see who's behind it all as we go into the seven bowl judgments. Huge oriental armies marching to the Middle East, the second wave of Armageddon. Once again, the angel lifts the trumpet, and it is the seventh judgment, the seventh trumpet judgment. And once again, it has to do with the heavens. I'll take a look at a report by Martinez Fritas. And this is what he had to say. There's a headline, Giant Blocks of Ice. Ice meteors signal worrisome climate change. A Spanish scientist says global warming may be to blame for giant blocks of ice which fell from clear skies and ripped gaping holes in cars and houses. The ice blocks weighed 22 pounds and left five foot holes in the houses. Now we've not had anything quite like that uh, in my lifetime, but they're seeing that already in some places of the world. Here, this is a report from Beijing. Hailstones as big as basketballs 
A rainstorm and a tornado pounded China's southern province, killing at least 37 people, injuring 453. The freak storm blew down trees and power lines and overturned cars. More than 2,000 houses collapsed. The heaviest hailstones weighed about 33 pounds. So you see, Jack, things are happening already right now as we make this video uh, in the heavens, and it's going to accelerate, right? Oh, and accelerate. There was a block of ice that fell in Brazil that weighed 440 pounds. But there's more. Dr. David Trevis, who chairs the Department of Geology at the University of Minnesota, said, there are now blocks of ice 43 to 46 miles in space, the size of houses. And fortunately, as they come in a downward direction, they dissolve and melt so that there's no great problem. But some of them could slip through. Mm. Now, this is the seventh trumpet judgment, as we'll see, and the seventh bowl judgment, which is the final 21st in history, pictures that these blocks of ice weigh one talent, and a talent is anywhere from 80 to 120 pounds. Mm. So there's no doubt that all this could happen. But Rexella, let's see what this judgment is all about. The seventh trumpet judgment found in Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 to 19. The seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God in their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Now get this, for it's so important in verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail from heaven. Now, this is the time when the Lord returns, and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. And at that time, if you study Revelation chapter 16, the Armageddon campaign, you see these same things happening and this talent of ice falling to the ground and causing great devastation and damage. And if it's already in its initial stages, as you've heard from reports Rexella gave, then folks, it can and will happen and you've been left behind, should be watching for it. Oh, yes, Jack. We're going to get in now to the vial or the bowl judgments. That's B-O-W-L, bowl. And every time they poured a vial or poured a bowl, it was a judgment on the earth. And the first bowl judgment is mankind covered with sores. Oh, Jack, uh, you know, we have seen some of that already uh, right now. Oh, and that's Revelation 16, verse 2. The first angel went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men, which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. That mark of the beast is 666. And those who receive it are going to be judged by God with unbelievable sores on their bodies. And you know, today we know of necrotizing fasciitis, the flesh-eating disease, and so many others, as I said earlier in this video, 25 new diseases caused by the beast of the field, and that's the exact prophecy of seal 4 in Revelation chapter 6, uh, verses 7 and 8. And one thing we do know, those who receive that mark have no hope. For Revelation 14, 11 says, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and forever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship this Antichrist and took 
his mark. For those who reject it, Revelation 20, verse 4 says, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Why? Because they would not worship this Antichrist or accept the infamous mark. If you've been left behind, watch out, be careful, and say no. I will not take the mark. And remember, I said it earlier, in Matthew 25, verse 31, when Christ returns, he says to millions in verse 34, come, inherit the kingdom, the thousand-year millennial reign. Now, somehow they survive without taking the mark, so millions upon millions are going to be able to escape. Find out what the loophole is, and you'll live. We're going to put bowls two and three together. And they are re-emphasis and expansion of trumpets two and three. So you got bowls two and three, trumpets two and three, and they are the same. Only with the bowls, it is much more uh, expanded. It's worse. It gets worse and worse. And we've already seen how it is the pollution of the waters in that judgment. Waterborne fish virus spreading fast and killing millions of fish. Reuters News Service, Dutch dioxin scare spreads into Germany and Belgium. A total of 162 Dutch cattle, pig, sheep, and goat farms, eight Belgian farms, and three German have bought a potato feed product that was contaminated with dioxin. Uh, friends, I believe that this terrible, terrible time will cause animals, you know, that are on livestock farms to die and also everything in the oceans, Jack, and the lakes will die. You need to restudy Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 to 11, where all of these horrendous problems are happening in the oceans and seas, rivers, streams of water. Now this is again repeated, but now with greater severity. And one finds bowls two and three as far as judgments are concerned, in Revelation 16, verses 3 and 4. And the second angel poured out his bowl upon the sea and became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. We go on. The third angel poured out his bowl upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became bloody and deadly. That's interesting, Rick Sella, because in Revelation chapter 8, verses 8 to 11, only one third of the oceans and streams became polluted. But here, it's so bad that every living creature in the sea dies. And it's easy to understand. When we already have 150 areas in our oceans, and some of them 27,000 square miles in length and breadth, and they are oxygen starved, and so millions upon millions of fish have already died. It's already beginning. It's going to get worse. Let's uh, talk now and reveal what Bowl 4 has to do uh, with what's coming right now. Sun is going to scorch humans. Uh, it has to do with the ozone layer once again. Sunspots more active in last 70 years than in 8,000 years before. Now they're very, very, as you well know, concerned about the temperatures and the recorded temperatures that we've been having. Sunspots are surface concentrations of the sun's magnetic field. And the more there are, the more energy the sun is emitting. So it could very well be, I think, Jack, that that's how the earth will be scorched during that time. And this judgment is mentioned in Revelation chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and power was given unto the sun to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues. And they repented not of their evil deeds. Now, they tell us that there is a depletion in the ozone layer, which allows the sun to penetrate in greater force upon human beings on the earth. 
and it could get so bad that men become scorched through the rays of the sun. We all know what a good sunburn is. Well, imagine if there's a magnification of these sunspots eight and ten times. Mm. The Bible says it will happen. But when it's happening, you would think that people would say, let's get right with God. No. They will not repent of their evil deeds. They're gnawing their tongues and they're blaspheming God's name, breaking one of the commandments. They would not repent of what? Well, in Revelation 9, verse 20, they're worshiping demons. Verse 21, they would not repent of their murders, their drug abuses, their fornications, and their thefts. Sin inundates the world of that time, and they just say, we love our sin, we love what we're doing, and we don't care. And so they do not repent, even with all of these judgments happening. Oh, the hardness of men's hearts. But if you've been left behind, think about it. Make a change, because there's hope for you as we're going to see. In just a moment, Jack, I can hardly wait to get there. We're almost there, friends, but another angel steps forth, picks up a bowl and pours it out on the earth. And it has to do with, once again, men being covered with sores. Uh, this could perhaps be AIDS epidemic that has accelerated. 46 million right now have the HIV virus worldwide. And it's a terrible, terrible thing in some parts of the world. HIV scars India's vast population. Jack, it is growing. It's, it's accelerating. And uh, it could be other things, too, where they're covered with sores, like the avian flu. Well, Rex, I do believe it's going to have to do with AIDS because in Revelation 6, verse 8, a fourth part of the population of the world dies because of their sores, diseases created by the beasts of the earth, wow. the beasts of the field, the right. green monkey virus. Mm -hmm. Of course, avian flu has to do with ducks and chickens, but you put it all together. But AIDS already has taken over 40 million. They say it's going to reach 100 million people in the next 10 years. Now, the fifth bowl judgment is described in Revelation chapter 16, verses 10 and 11. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the seat of the Antichrist, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And again, they repented not of all their wicked deeds. What does it take to get men to turn from their sin? Oh, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But people will continue in their sins until they drop dead, and it's too late. If you're left behind, don't be like this predicted crowd who are alive right now as you're alive, and they're blaspheming God, and they're gnawing their tongues in their pain, and they will not repent. Don't be like them. Turn to God. Tell Him you're sorry. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, verse 9. Do it in a few minutes from mm, now. Love it, Jack. Well, once again, bowl 6 is a repeat of trumpet 2, the second trumpet judgment. It is China's invasion. The Lord is reemphasizing this huge, huge army that's coming over to Israel, the Battle of Armageddon, the world's largest army. Chinese military buildup causes U.S. concern. How are they going to get there? They've got to cross over some water. Well, there's a dam there in Turkey that allows them to cross over on dry land. And China, Russia to stage war games. Now, this is an Associated Press release, an unprecedented joint military maneuver. They are going to join together. What a huge army with their allies as they march to the Middle East. And Jack, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like, that Battle of Armageddon. Oh, the judgment of bull six recorded in Revelation 16, 12. The sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river Euphrates, and the water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The British Revised Version has it, the kings of the sun rising. 
that would be led by China and, of course, taken many of the Asian nations. Now, this is interesting because as they come across the area of the Euphrates on their march to Israel, and this is the second phase of the Armageddon campaign, the waters are dried up. This seemed to be ridiculous 30, 40 years ago, but not now, because that picture Rexella showed you was the Anatark Dam in Turkey, and it has uh, 21 different levels and levers where they can pull back, and that is called the Alatoya Project, and through it they can dry up the entire area so that for the first time in world history, troops can come from China and march straight through on dry ground. What a day to be alive, and you've been left behind, are going to see it. And it's the bloodiest battle in history. We told you about it earlier in Revelation 9, 14 to 18. Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. There's the tie-in. Verse 15 says, by it, a third part of mankind is slain. Why the number of the army is 200,000, 200 million. You know why you preachers are wrong saying every sign was fulfilled before AD 70? Because the population of the world wasn't even 200 million then. Mm. This picture is a time in the future when 200 million troops are coming out of the Orient. And do you know that the CIA told us just two years ago that China now has trained 200 million for warfare. They're not all in the service, but they are trained. And so this judgment is coming. The second phase of the Armageddon campaign, first Russia, then China, and then all nations coming against Jerusalem, Zechariah 14, verse 2. Can you imagine now the last bowl that the angel is going to pour on the earth, and it will be the greatest earthquake in history. Well, we all know about the tsunami that happened not too long ago and the terrible disaster. But I'd like you to take a look at the records since 1293 compiled by the University of Southern California. The worst tsunamis in history. We will not be able to read all of them for you, but let's just take a look as, as we go through there, starting with 1293. Horrible, horrible thing. And yet, the worst one that ever happened was the one that we witnessed in 2004. In Indonesia, 168,000 people died because of that terrible, terrible disaster. And yet, when this bull is poured upon the earth, it will be the worst, greatest earthquake in history. Oh, Jack, uh, again, my mind cannot uh, go there. We dealt with all of these tsunamis because what happens is there's an earthquake in the oceans and that causes all of this turmoil like we've just experienced. This is found in Revelation 16, verses 17 and 18. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. Now, what earthquake is that? The Bible predicts many. In Revelation 6, 12, chapter 8, verse 5, chapter 11, verses 13 and 19, and this one, the greatest in history, in chapter 16, verse 18. But get the picture. This is when Armageddon is fought in the 16th chapter. Three and a half years of bloody warfare. And during that time, verse 21 occurs when these ice blocks are falling to the earth, plus the greatest earthquake. Why? It is at the moment of Armageddon toward the last few months that our Lord Jesus Christ returns to put a stop to those who are destroying the earth and destroying one another, Revelation 11, 18. And when and where is he going to do it? Well, that's Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2, when all the nations of the world come against Israel, for and against, and it's going to be the bloodiest battle in history 
because Revelation chapter 14, verse 20 says that the blood's going to flow to the bridles of the horses by a space of 200 miles in length, the exact length of the nation called Israel. So it's literally saying Israel will be a land soaked in blood from coast to coast. And oh, God loves his ancient people. And so the Lord Jesus comes to put a stop to those who are destroying the world and destroying one another. Revelation 11, verse 18. And you know, when he arrives, his feet hit the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, verse 4, and the earthquake is so gigantic, so horrendous, that it splits the mountain straight down from east to west. Now, I believe that's the sign of his coming, not the signs. The signs point to the sign. What is the sign? Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 27, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. But not only is the bolt of lightning from east to west, but as his feet hit the Mount of Olives, it splits from east to west. I believe that's the sign. And all the signs we gave you earlier in this video are pointing to that momentous event. Oh, that's what you're going to see next. You who have been left behind, the return of the Lord Jesus in all of his glory to set up his kingdom for 1,000 years upon this earth. So the Lord is not coming back to destroy the world at all. He's coming back to stop us from destroying the oh, world, right, amen. Jack? Amen. Well, all the Armageddon and all the rest, it's going to be finished. And what are we going to have? We're going to have health and peace and prolonged life. I love this. Take a look at the cover of Life Magazine, 2,000 Years of Christianity, The Meaning of the Millennium. A beating heart tissue grown in lab. Woman's heart rebuilt with cow human tissue. Gene therapy is first deafness cure. Bionic eye may help reverse blindness. Talk about good health. Cell transplant restores vision. 1,000 years literal or figurative. And uh, where is Jesus going to do this? Jews now have a Sanhedrin and have started looking for a son of David to be king. You know what? That's where Jesus is coming back and he's going to set up his kingdom right there. They already have a Sanhedrin, Jack. Oh, let me tie this together, Rexella. The Bible teaches that when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and his saints come with him, Jude verse 14, that he comes as the King of the kings and Lord of the lords. Revelation 19, verse 16 is already said in this video, to rule and reign for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4. When he sets up this glorious millennial kingdom, there's going to be health galore. And you know, so many of those articles had to do with the new inventions yes. and vision, mm -hmm. how people will be able to see once again. Well, isn't that what Isaiah 35 Verses 5 and 6 has to say, When Jesus comes, the eyes of the blind will be open. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap as a heart like a deer. And the tongues of the tongue tie shall sing. And there'll be a highway running through all of that 